So when in Parsha Vietnam, the Et Hanan, when Moshe was asking 515 times, begging to come into the Holy Land, what was it that he was going to gain after all the high experiences being with Hashem three times on the mountain for 40 days, each being always available to speak to Hashem face to face, innerness to innerness, what could he get from this? <clears throat> and the sages say that although Moshe had learned from Hashem the meaning of all of the mitzvahs, so he knew what the mitzvahs were, but Moshe wanted to actually observe the mitzvahs in the Holy Land. So let's talk about what that means. What is the great importance of mitzvah observance? And in this way, this is something completely different. Judaism and Torah is completely different than anything else and anyone else in, the import, in mitzvahs and what mitzvahs are not to mention everything else, but other faiths see meditation, prayer, study as the goal to go beyond this world, to get beyond the physical dimensions of the world is what they want. Our perspective is different. So why should mitzvahs be fulfilled and what are they doing? So the main thing is that God wants, God has a desire for us to fill the, fulfill these mitzvahs. Now, <coughs> desire is very high up there. It's even higher than will. So God wants us to do these misses, but it comes from a desire that is a very, very high desire in God. And God's, both God's will and God's desire are one with God. To put that simply, God is beyond all understanding. And we cannot understand what does it mean God desires something we don't know. It's very interesting. The concept of desire is so far beyond the mind. It actually says in the Talmud that if, if some, a woman is expecting and she wants, she really, really wants some kind of food and it's the middle of the night, her husband should get up and go to the store and get that food for her. That it's not... It's not about, it makes sense, or, come on, that's what you want to eat? No. That when it comes from a high, high desire, that it is very connected to the essence. It means something important. So when God, God, God's essence and God's desire are one, and God's will, God is one. So we don't know why God knows this, but we know that if God wants this, you know, like the husband who said, oh, honey, you want that? And he gets up and he leaves in the middle of the night to find a 24-hour supermarket so he can buy what she wants. We know that that, if God desires it, that motivates us to do it. So prayer, meditation, and study lift us above the world to some degree but this depends on the nature of our minds and our emotions. And we can learn only so far with the rational mind. We'll talk about that a little bit later also. So the sages say that before the giving of the Torah, there was a decree separating the world from God because our minds and our hearts could not reach God on their own. So the question is, how can we reach God? And the answer is by doing what he says, by doing what he wants and says in the Torah. In this way, we connect to God. So we have to talk more about what that means. The mitzvah shares a connection to the word tzavta, which means bond. And the observance of a mitzvah 
sometimes gives us inspired feelings and sometimes they don't. That also depends on how we do the mitzvah. Like a person can light candles for Shabbat and boom, boom, ah, just a second, I have to uncover the, you know, the, the kugel or I have to, do, do, I have to, do, do. and then the mitzvah is done and you did the mitzvah 100% and that's it, done. But sometimes we are able to stand at the candles and use it as a time to pray and then sit and look at the candles and do the mitzvah with our heart and soul. Now, what's very interesting is the Lubavitcher Rebbe says, Hamasehu ha'ikar. The main thing is the deed. So if you did it, you did it completely. But we do, sometimes we don't get inspired feelings when we do a mitzvah because we don't at all understand what we're doing. And other times we're able to put ourselves into it in such a way that we try to do that. But that's not the important part. The important part is that by doing the mitzvah, we connect ourselves to God in the way that God wants. In other words, we're connecting to God on his terms. It's one thing when we say, what could I do for you? I'd like to do something for you. One example of this is, you know, the husband wants to bring his, fla his wife flowers. What if she really likes, you know, peonies, petunias, is something she really, really likes. And maybe that's not his favorite flower, but when he brings her what she would like, there is more of a connection because it's what she really, really wants. So these are examples of how important it is to connect with God on his terms in the way that God wants. Now, what's interesting is that these are acts of service of God, doing this is an act of service of God but it extends our bond with God down into the world. In other words, the bond that we have, we're saying that Moshe was so up there and really there, but God wants us to really bring godliness down here. So when we do the mitzvah down here, it is connecting to Hashem right now, right here where we are in this world. And also the mitzvah includes the, the material object with which the mitzvah is performed. So when a Jew puts a coin in, in a tzedakah box for charity, or he does any other mitzvah, that mitzvah becomes connected in some way with the physical object. In other words, we're, there is the highest bond, learning Torah, connecting into Hashem in the highest way we can, and there is the deepest bond. So what Hashem wants ultimately is all of it, of course, that we should be completely bonded to Hashem. But, the, but in some ways, it's easier, you know, I know it's hard to say what's easier, but it feels more sublime sometimes to be up there connected, which doesn't mean we shouldn't if we can, but bringing godliness down into the world is what Moshe wanted. Moshe knew his connection up there, but coming down into the world to take all those misses that he had taught and actually be able to do them in the real world, physically, is something different. We, we mentioned once that the Babaji Rebbe says that in, in this time, in the three weeks, it's very good to learn about the Beit HaMikdash, and that that's something that Hashem wanted that we should do this. And it's something we want to do, and that we do, and that we're happy to do. We focus on, on Mashiach coming, we focus on the Beit HaMikdash we built. But the truth is that living with Mashiach actually 
living with the Beit HaMikdash rebuilt actually, doing the actual mitzvahs of coming to the Beit HaMikdash is something much more profound and much more deep. It's here, and that's what we are waiting for. So that was what Moshe was praying for. So let's understand mitzvahs a little more because if this is Mo Moshe's focus at this time, let's focus on this as well. There is a verse from this parsha from the Hanan that says, "The atem hadvekim b'Hashem chayim kuchem hayom," and you who cleave dvekim, you who cleave to God. It's actually interesting. The atem hadvekim be Hashem. All of you who cleave, it really says in Hashem are all alive today. So it's interesting. Chaim Kulchem are all alive. It means this is real life to cleave to Hashem. When you are cleaving into Hashem, you are totally alive. And totally alive means all of our being, our souls, our minds, our, our, our hearts, our actions, that when we're cleaving to Hashem, we're totally on with the life that Hashem is giving us. And Hayom, today, meaning now, that this Dvekut is not something, of course, it will be, when Mashiach is here, it will be in a much more profound way. But if you cleave to Hashem, today, we're completely alive when we do this. So this is, and this is said actually at the beginning uh, when the, before the first person is called up to the Torah reading. So this is said in the, in the, in the Beit Knesset every single time that there is a, every time that somebody comes, then, well, then this is done. Okay. So what does this mean, cleaving to God? So God is the creator of the universe. He's infinite and he's much more than that. Any word you can say is not enough. So God is the source of all being and is beyond all being. So how can we cleave to God? Because cleave means join together, to be one. How can this world, how can this word to cleave apply to little tiny us with boundless eternal God. So the Baal Shem Tov says that even though we are tiny physically, we have within us a spark of the divine. This is our essential soul. And this inner soul yearns to join with Hashem. This is the nature of the soul because the the inner aspect of the soul is really connected into God. And like a flame that wants to go up <coughs> and reconnect to its source, the inner soul is always yearning to connect to God. So how can we do it? Through Torah, through prayer, and through mitzvot. So God puts himself in the Torah. And when we study Torah, we are joining with him. So I want to say just a couple of words about Torah. First of all, learning Torah is also a mitzvah. Learning Torah is essential, and learning Torah is a mitzvah. The truth is you can't do the mitzvah properly without learning Torah. But what happens when we are learning Torah? This is very essential. First of all, we need to know that when God is teaching us Torah, that God is sharing his mind in Torah. He's sharing himself in Torah. That Hashem places himself in the Torah. When we learn Torah, we are inside Hashem's thoughts. And Hashem's thoughts are inside us. 
Let me say that again. We are learning Torah. We are in Hashem's thoughts, in Hashem's mind, in Hashem's thoughts. And Hashem's thoughts are inside us. And this is an awesome connection, an awesome, intense union. In Sefer Tanya, it says that when you're speaking, you're supposed to learn Torah, not just the Torah. You're supposed to say the words as we learn them. It says that when you are speaking these words of Torah, it's like you're kissing God, because God is saying the words to you, and you are saying the words to God. And so these words are a clear through Torah. The Torah learning. Prayer is another way of connecting to God. When we pray, we are opening ourselves to God. We're speaking to God from the depths of our hearts. Speaking our own words is fine, and in any language is fine. But the prayers that we say, Shacharit, Mincha, Marit, the prayers that that we say come from the early sages, from the members of the great assembly thousands of years ago. And they wrote down these prayers, they compiled the prayers. The prayers, by the way, are connected to the offerings in the temple. So there are prayers considered like offerings in the temple. And they have profound mystical meanings, more than what we understand. As well as it's reminding us of where we're coming from and where we're going to. So this is giving us an opportunity to connect to what's really essential in who we are, in God's plan. So these prayers. Sometimes people are hesitant, especially you know, when they first begin with prayers, to say, but these aren't my words. But these prayers are the words of our, grand, our parents, our grandparents, our great-grandparents all the way back. So they're like well-worn paths that we have spoken for generations. And when we speak these words to God, we are walking our own paths connected to the holiness of generations of prayers with their connection of God. And when we pray with devotion and give ourselves over to God, we have a deeply inspiring experience being close to God. My aunt, my aunt Frida, blessed memory, I met her in Israel first time when I was 30. She was wonderful, my father's sister. Um, she told me that as she got older, that the prayers meant more to her. That she understood what they were saying more deeply. And that she prayed in a different way than she used to pray. I'm also feeling this with the prayers that when we are, if you read the prayers and if you can read them in any language that you want, that what we're asking for God to restore, to bring us home, to get rid of the whatever doesn't want God, so much is being said that these are really my prayers. They're really what I want to say. That if I was trying to figure out in my own words how to say all these things, yes, I do. I say, Hashem, please bring Mashiach. Hashem, bring us to the Holy Land. I say these things. But the depth and the detail of the prayers that the men of the Great Assembly established say it much better than I can say it. And if somebody is doesn't 
realized that I was uncomfortable with that, I suggest praying it in the language that is most comfortable to you. So now we've spoken about learning Torah, about prayer, and the third level of dveikut, of connection with God, is the mitzvot. And in some ways, they are the most profound. Each one is profound in their own way. But mitzvah, which is translated as command and connection, gives us a connection in God. So in doing a mitzvah, we're connected to and bonding with God. Now, on the on the other level, on the outer level, there's um, an example given in Hasidut about a person who's you not know, like a regular person and either the wise person or the king, whoever is somebody very important, asks him to do something for him. And the regular person, let me do that for you. Of course, I'm so happy to do that for you. Of course, what can I do for you? Tell me. Just, um, I'm gonna do it. And he does it. And what happens is that as he is doing it, his constant thought is, I am doing this for the sage, or I'm doing this for the king. And I wanna do it right. And I wanna do exactly what the king wants. And I wanna bring it back to him the way he wants it brought back. And what it says is that when we, do a mitzvah, Hashem gets nachat ruach. That means Hashem gets pleasure. What Hashem wanted from that person becomes fulfilled. And then the person, this person that the sage asked to do something for him, they're bonded together. And his life has changed because he's not just doing whatever he does. Now he is, he recognizes himself and others recognize him as being in service. And the king, of course, recognizes him as one who serves me. Hello, so, Hello. Yes. I'm so sorry, excuse me. There's a lot of noise but nobody's mic is on. Are you perhaps touching the mic with the papers or? I don't know. Okay, I'll take care of that. Thank you. Okay. So what happens is that when we do this mitzvah, which is the will of God, we are completely connecting to God. And this is essential and it is a privilege that God gives us this opportunity. The Sefer Achinuch, we mentioned him recently as being, as being a person, a 13th century Spanish scholar who worked with categorizing all the mitzvahs and spoke about the six constant mitzvahs. He says, a person's attitudes are molded by his behavior. And he describes that how through good deeds and Torah study, a wicked heart can be transformed to good. Through Torah study and good deeds, a person with a wicked heart can be transformed to good. While the opposite occurs when somebody has a good heart and wicked deeds. So what we do is defining us. And Sefer Chinuch is saying that there are attitudes which our attitudes are affected by the way that we do mitzvot and different mitzvot do different things and refine us in different ways. So we're understanding here that God is utilizing the mitzvahs to shape us into people who emulate God 
and become refined people. There is a story about a yeshiva bacher, a yeshiva student, who in the time of the Rebbe Rashab, so he's our Rebbe, and then he's the Friedeke Rebbe, the one before him, and his father, the Rebbe Rashab. So the Rebbe Rashab was the Rebbe, and his son, the Friedeke Rebbe, who was then to become, later to become the Rebbe, the, the Rebbe Rashab was very involved in the yeshiva, even though his son was in charge of it. So there would be times that he would meet all the boys in the yeshiva, the young men. And there was one young man who learned well, but was very unrefined, very coarse. And the Rebbe Rashab took interest in him. How could he refine this young man? So he told his son, the Friedrich Rebbe, who was to become the Friedrich Rebbe, okay, he gave him a whole program. When the time comes to bring in the wheat to make the matzahs, give him the hardest job. Make sure he's really put him in charge of things. And then give him this mimer, this learning in Hasidus, and tell him he has to learn it. And on that and that day, he has to come back to you and review the mimer. Then, later on, tell him that in terms of baking the matzot, he is in charge of doing that. And he has to make sure that everything happens properly. He gave him job after job after job, and he has to learn this mimer and come back to you and review it. And on the day before Pesach, he was in charge of even more action <clears throat> and also had to show up having learned another mime. So he was, how he did it is amazing because <laughs> he was constantly involved in learning Torah, learning Hasidus, and doing mitzvahs. But he did it. He gave himself over to it dedicated himself to it, and he did it. When it came to the Seder, that year, the, all the boys from the yeshiva were sitting together, and the Rebbe Rashab came to them, and, the, and his son, who was in charge of the yeshiva, was there. And it says that this is in the diary of the Friedrich Rebbe. That's how we know this. So this happened with him. And the Rebbe Shab leaned over to him and said, see, doing all that work with Nasirat Nefesh, with true dedication, look at his face. Look how he has changed. Look how refined he is. So God is doing this with us, working with our natures, teaching us Torah, refining us through mitzvahs. And it says, when we do a mitzvah, very often we say, Asher kiddushanu b'mitzvah tav, v'tzivanu, on doing this particular mitzvah. And this means we become, sanct become sanctified to God, like wedded, like asher kiddushanu, like kiddushan, like the, like the same word as getting married. Because... In the time that we do the mitzvah, we are in a union together with God. The Kabbalists of 16th century Tzvat, particularly Rabbi Yitzhak Luria, the Arizal, whose, um, whose yard site was this week on Hey Av, the fifth of Av, says that mitzvot bring the world into a harmonious state that can receive godly light. Kabbalistically, we learn that when God has a mitzvah for us to do, that he tells us at Har Sinai, this is what I want you to do. And we are down here and we do the mitzvah, that what happens is that one thing that we learn is that every mitzvah has a channel of light that is connected to it. When we do the mitzvah down here, 
and we take, for example, that mitzvah, and we do it down here, we have light going up and down between God's mitzvah and the channel that we bring into the world, the channel of light. So when the Arizal was said, is that we're making this world a place that can receive life and does receive life through the mitzvahs, we are then getting ready for what is going to be at any moment for the Mashiach and the, and the time of Gula, of redemption, when it will be possible to do all the mitzvot fully in their ideal context, and the world will be filled with godly light, it says, as the waters cover the ocean bed. We need to know that the act of the mitzvah is an end in itself. And despite all the amazing things that the mitzvah does, that ultimately says that most of the reward for the mitzvah will be after the coming of Mashiach, when all that light will shine. <clears throat> I also learned yesterday in Tanya that the mitzvot are a protection to us in the sense of that when all that amazing godly light comes, I don't know if the word is for protection, the more it's like a vessel, that when we do the mitzvot, we have a vessel to receive the godly light so that we can put it into meaningful context. So, but it says the reward of the mitzvah is the mitzvah itself. If we would know what we're doing when we're doing a mitzvah that Hashem is asking us to do, if we would know what we're doing, then, and we will know, because the light will fill those vessels. So, but what we need to do, we need to know is even though there will be this future filling the mitzvahs that we do, we need to know that when we're doing a mitzvah now, that we and our world, meaning we and wherever we're doing the mitzvah and with whatever we're doing the mitzvah with, are one with Hashem himself. We're all learning Torah right now. Would you believe our computers are being used for something holy? It's not just a hunk of metal with all kinds of wires and whatever goes on in there, but we are utilizing this for the service of God. So we also know that when, because God wants it, that when we're doing a mitzvah, that we become an expression of God's will. That like the example of the, the sage, the wise man, the king, who asked somebody, some regular person to do something for him. This is so that the sage and the wise man doesn't have to do it himself. He wants it done for him. So when he is saying, I would like Shabbat and I would like, you know, challah for Shabbat, the king doesn't have to bake it himself. He could say, this is a mitzvah. Please do this for me. Oh, my pleasure. If this is a mitzvah that I could do for you and I'm happy to bring you hello, then this is changing everything because we're joined to Hashem, to the inner will and desire of the one who commands us. So sometimes what we're doing is a practical mitzvah, lighting the Shabbos candles, putting on a, a, mitz, a mezuzah, putting on tefillin, giving tzedakah, keeping our kitchen kosher. Sometimes it's a law that guides our emotions, such as to love a fellow Jew, which is a mitzvah in the Torah. But the mitzvah is also expressed practically, such as doing something to help the person. And we see that there are so many organizations and so many individuals asking, how can I do a mitzvah? I have some friends that I call mitzvah girls. 
because they really look for a mitzvah. I have a friend who um, called an old age home already. She did it already and said, what can we do for Rosh Hashanah? Now that people can't go into the old age homes and she used to bring little girls there to talk to the old people. She said, how can we do this that if my husband blows, blows a shofar on Rosh Hashanah that they could hear it? Well, you can't come in. Okay, but if you open the front doors, you know, and stand on it, and the people are all sitting there in a semicircle, would that work? Yes. And what about the garden? Is there a way we can come? So she's figuring out how she could do the mitzvah and engage other people in the same mitzvah so that everyone will hear the the shofar and Rosh Hashanah. She already has it arranged. They said, yes. That's, that's why I call her a mitzvah girl because she looks for mitzvah to do. It's very, very impressive to me. So she's involved and we're all involved in our own ways in doing mitzvah to serve God. So at that time, through the action of the mitzvah, the person and God are joined together. Now we need to know, when we talk about Hashem as he is, Hashem himself, we talk about Hashem, there's a word that we use in Hasidut, which is called Atzmut. That is God who he is. When we say Anochi, I'm the Lord your God, that Anochi, Anochi Hashem Elokecha, which is higher than your Kevavke, higher than God's name. We're talking about God's essence. And when God wants something, it is connected into his essence. In other words, how did this world altogether come about? Actually, Hashem had this desire. Whatever that means, I have to understand Hashem had a desire. Whatever it is, it comes from his essence that Hashem wanted us to serve him. He wanted to be in relationship with us. And the whole world is for that purpose. Everything in the world is for that purpose. That each of us should have our own personal connection in relationship with God. We as a people, and on another level, the whole world will come to know that there is one God. But God wants each of us to have our relationship with God, and each of us has a soul. In the essence of our soul, we are all one. But each of us, in a certain way, has I have my relationship with God. And the world and everything that I experience in my world is in a certain way the stage that God is giving me to be able to relate to God. In other words, is there something I need to do? Is there a mitzvah that I can do? Given who I am, where I am, what time this is, what's going on, and each of us has I in my personal relationship with God. And that is essential. And God is empowering us to do what we are here to do. We need to feel empowered by God. And it's really not about if other people get it or not. Because each of us has to have this relationship. We as a people have to have this relationship but individually after this relationship. And we each have a different stage. Somebody is rushing out to make sure that you have food for your little children who are home. Other people are making a phone call to somebody else who needs a phone call or would love to have a phone call. Different people are doing different things. But each of these situations is me in my relationship in Hashem. So we need to know that. We also need to know that God's will is coming from God's essence. 
and that when we are doing God's will in this world, that God's inner self, God's essence is related to us here in this world. And that's not all the time with everything. Yes, all there is is God. But this essential connection between God's, so to speak, inner self, even when we don't understand what God is asking us to do, even when it's a mitzvah that, I don't understand why we do that, but you want it, you got it. So we need to know that when God is giving us his Torah and telling us what he wants, and when we have an opportunity to offer ourselves to prayer, and when God is saying, this is what I want you to do, this all awakens our desire to cleave to God. And then we come back to the Torah verse that through cleaving to God by means of Torah, prayer, and mitzvot, every aspect of our being is changed and we become truly alive. So I want to say one more thing about Moshe and his desire to come into the land. I mentioned that I would say another reason why Moshe wanted to come into the land. The first one, which we discussed today, is because Moshe wanted to do the mitzvot that you could only do in the land. And he wanted to do that, to serve God as we have spoken with that kind of inner connection that's not only a high connection, but a deep connection all the way down into the world to make this world a place where God is known. So I'm going to just say the, another reason why Moshe wanted to come to the land, and then to speak about a measure that has to do with Tisha B'Av. Okay, so coming to Moshe. Moshe was the most humble person in the world and the greatest prophet in the world. And he was not thinking about his own spiritual achievements. So on this level, we have a different understanding of why Moshe wanted to come to the Holy Land. And it wasn't for himself. And it wasn't even for the deeper relationship he could have. That's true, and this is true. These are all perspectives, all true. If he would have been the one to lead the Jewish people into the promised land, he would have been re revealed as the Mashiach. And all the things that have happened since the passing of Moshe, all the trials and tribulations that the Jews have gone through in all the centuries would not have happened. They would have been avoided. Hashem understood that. Hashem, of course, knew that if Moshe comes to the Holy Land, he will be the Mashiach, because whatever Moshe does is forever. And Hashem could have accepted the 515 prayers that were being spoken, but Hashem didn't. He did, why didn't Hashem allow Moshe to become the Mashiach at that time? Now, one answer that people say is that they didn't, the people had done many sins, they weren't really trusting Hashem through all those years in the desert. They weren't ready for Mashiach. But on a deeper level, Mashiach's coming was not a punishment. It was withheld because the world had not been refined to the extent that it was ready to receive him. So if Moshe would have become Mashiach, he would have become Mashiach at a time that the world wasn't really ready to receive it. Because the ultimate redemption isn't, you know, Hashem is ready to give the ultimate redemption right now. And it says, if you cleave to Hashem, you are alive. All this is Hayom. He said that. Hayom, and the last to talk about with Hayom. 
one of the things that we learn with Hayom is that Mashiach said, um, I'll come, I'm coming today. Mashiach is ready to come today, every day. Now, Mashiach is here. Mashiach is ready to come every day. And there's no if. But what Hashem wants is not that he should just give from above, but that God wanted, at the time of Moshe, God wanted that the work should be done through the people to refine the world, to refine our animal souls, and to refine the world. This is what makes the world ready for Mashiach. Every single mitzvah we do, the Torah we learn, the prayer we do, the mitzvah we do, brings channels of light into the world and refines the world. It used to be that the world was completely full of idolatry. These days, people who want to do that, free choice, you know? But everybody knows there is God. Everybody knows that Mashiach is coming. Everybody. The Rambam says that the two other main religions, which both teach that Mashiach is coming, that that is the main purpose of those religions because the world is prepared through us. They say clearly they learned it from us. From us, it used to be people worked seven days a week. It's our mitzvah to keep Shabbat, but the concept of people need time out, shouldn't be working seven days a week, comes from us. The world has been refined and people know that Let's just say the world is ready. The Rebbe said the world is ready for Mashiach now. We have done the work for all these many, many thousands of years. And the world is ready for the revelation of God that will take place in the time of Mashiach. And the Rebbe says, open your eyes and you will see that Mashiach is here. So this is a mindset, remember, in Kabbalah, eyes are mind, hearing, hearing is heart. So it's a mindset that we need to ready ourselves that Mashiach is here and we're ready for Mashiach and we have to open our eyes, which means open our minds and not get stuck in the news and other stuff. So may that be immediately. So now let's talk for a minute about Tisha B'Av, <coughs> which will actually be tonight and tomorrow. And we're going, so let's talk for a minute about this, um, what we do. And there's an interesting medrash. So Tisha B'Av commemorates the day that both the first and second holy temples in Jerusalem were destroyed, as well as many other things that happened through the years. So this is a day of mourning and we abstain from many pleasurable activities such as eating, drinking, bathing, washing, anointing ourselves. I usually put on the creams in the afternoon today, but not tonight or tomorrow. And marital relations, wearing leather shoes and sitting on a normal height chair. These are not things that we do starting tonight and tomorrow. But there are certain morning practices like sitting on low stools and not putting on a talit and tefillin that are actually suspended in the afternoon. In other words, whenever that is, one o'clock, two o'clock, you already don't need to sit on a low stool and men take out their toilet and to fill in. Why? This is 
right in the, in the middle of the day. And the Talmud describes the destruction as follows. Okay, this I'm going to read to you what it says in the Talmud. On the seventh day of Av, so today's the eighth day, tomorrow's the ninth day. On the seventh day of Av, the heathens entered the holy temple, the Romans. They ate and drank, Babylonians also, they ate and drank and wreaked havoc on it on the seventh and eighth days. On the ninth, toward evening, they set fire to the temple and it continued to burn throughout the 10th day until sunset. And the Talmud then goes on to explain that the reason the fast was not sent for the 10th day when most of the burning was happening is that the beginning is the most painful. So set, the temple was set on fire on the ninth day. But then you ask the question, it's Talmud asks the question, so why would certain morning practices be suspended on the afternoon when the holy temple was actually set on fire? During the afternoon services on Tisha B'Av, we add the special prayer, Nachem which means console, and we, which we ask God to console us. Why is Nachem delayed until the afternoon? We don't say it in the morning, say it in the afternoon. So two things, there is a tradition that it is not proper to console a morning, a mourner until his departed one has been buried because his mind is full of his responsibility to take care of the burial of his loved one. Only after the burial is he able to have enough peace of mind that he can think about himself and then one can console him. In the same sense, we don't ask God to comfort us until for the destruction of the temple until the time of day when it was actually partially burned. And there are other aspects, some other aspects, we continue not to eat, not to drink, that are lessened in the afternoon. So this is, it doesn't seem to make any sense. So this is paradoxical. There's something paradoxical about Tisha B'Av, about the ninth of Av. So on most days of the year, we say tachanun, shamanu, bagana. These are prayers of confession and supplication. But we don't say this on Shabbat, and we don't say it on special joyous occasions and holidays on which we omit tachanun. Yet on the ninth day of Av, which is the saddest day of the Jewish calendar, we do not say Tachon. All this is coming from the Talmud. The explanation given is that Echa, the Book of Lamentations, is referring to the destruction of the temple as a moed. What are you eating? That the night, that the day of, that the day of Tisha B'Av is actually referred to as a moed. A moed means an appointed time or a holiday. What? Tisha B'Av is a holiday? Why? So again, the Talmud is bringing. We read in Lamentations, the Lord has put out his fury. He has poured out his fierce anger and he has kindled a fire in Zion, which has consumed her foundations. So, God put his anger out on burning the Beit HaMikdash. And in explaining this verse, the Medrash notes this verse in Tehillim. 
a song of Asaph. Oh God, nations have come into your heritage. They have defiled your holy temple. They have made Yerushalayim into heaps. And the Medrash wonders, why is it that this verse, the song of Asaph, oh God, nations have come into your heritage, that is talking about the destruction of the temple and Jerusalem is described as a song. How can one sing about something as painful as that? There's an explanation that's given with a, with a, a mashal. And I'm not gonna tell the mashal, but the Medrash asks Asaf, the Holy One, blessed be he, destroyed the temple and you are sitting and playing music? And he said, I am playing music because the Holy One, blessed be he, poured out his anger on wood and stone and did not pour out his anger on Israel. So the Medrash is giving us a new perspective with which to see this verse in Lamentations and Echa, he kindled a fire in Zion, which consumed its foundation. So what's happening here is that there is a blessing hidden in the destruction. Now, the truth is that during the physical of destruction, destruction of Jerusalem, many Jews were killed. But the sages saw, they tell us that when the temple became engulfed in flames, the Jews saw that God had turned his anger away from them and put it on the wood and stones of his holy house. And this is the joy that Asaph expresses in his to him. So we understand that the destruction of the temple meant that the Jewish nation was spared. And although we grieve for the temples and living in the Holy Land and living to serve Hashem in the temples, we understand why the anniversary of this destruction is considered a moed, a holiday. Why, and also why the time of day when the burning began is less sad than the rest of the day. But there's another reason as well. The sages tell us that in the afternoon at Mincha time, when the time with, that the Holy Temple was lit on fire, that Mashiach, the future redeemer of this exile was born. Mashiach is born in the afternoon at Mincha time. And of course, there's a range when you can say Mincha. What does it mean that Mashiach was born? It does not mean that an infant was born. Being born means that he was born into readiness for revelation. Mashiach is constantly waiting for us to be ready. And on this lowest, lowest time, Mashiach says, yes, he's given like new life and new energy and new birth. I'm ready. He's always ready. But at this time particularly, he's born and ready. So we are ready, but we have to be really ready which means we have to open our eyes, open our minds and say, Mashiach is here, I'm ready. And mean it. And ask for it. The Arizal says that since Mashiach, Mashiach has a number of names. One of the names of Mashiach is Menachem, which means consoler. So that at this time we say the prayer in the afternoon of Nachem, which means we're asking God for consolation. So what happens is in the darkest, darkest time, tomorrow afternoon, when the Holy Temple is set ablaze, there is a spark of hope and light 
that is kindled for every Jew. So even though it's our saddest day, it's the day of our greatest hope. So when it comes to the afternoon, we no longer sit on low chairs. And many people have a custom to begin to tidy up the house. Why? So that we should not get stuck in anguish and mourning about the past. When there is a reading of Echa tonight, when people read Lamentations in the morning, it's horrible. And there's anguish at this, the losses that we don't have the Beit HaMikdash now. It's a huge loss. We can't even imagine what it means. That's what a kind of a loss it is. But we, Hashem doesn't want us to get stuck in that because that doesn't help anything. So at the very darkest time of the morning, we get up from the low chair and we shift our focus to the future. This is so important, not to get stuck in the past, but to shift our focus to the future, to get ready for Mashiach, tidying up our houses one way that we get ready for the coming of Mashiach. We're getting ready, we're moving forward. And then we have the deepest, hope and prayer, Nachem, we're asking Hashem to console us, that finally Hashem will really console us with the coming of Mashiach and the rebuilding of the Holy Temple. And so we are waiting for Hashem to fulfill his promise that these days and this day, Tisha B'Av, will be transformed into a real holiday. It will become this day and all these three weeks and all these days will become times of joy and happiness, times of serving God in a more profound way, times when all, like Moshe said, all the mitzvahs he wanted to do in the Holy Land with the Beit HaMikdash, that we will do all of that, that our Torah learning will light up for us, that our prayers will be well, the, all the connections of Torah, prayer, and mitzvahs, all the connections of everything that we do will light up and we will have Mashiach revealed and we will know Hashem beyond anything that we can imagine because it's already prepared. It is already prepared and we are ready. I just want to say one more thing about that. There are people who are saying that Mashiach's not here now because, of, and then a lot of blame for all the wrong things that people are doing. The Rebbe says Mashiach is ready to come and that we are good and that we have done what we need to do. It is not a good idea for us to focus on negativity and to not be good to ourselves. Each one of us knows if there's something else that we could do. If we have, hopefully Mashiach will come immediately, but let's say that I have a few minutes to do something. What is that something I could do? How can I serve Hashem in these moments that I have right now? So the point is to be connected to Hashem and ask, what can I do right now? And always feel the connection, always learn Torah, say a prayer, do a mitzvah, We've been having a class on the six constant mitzvahs, which we're supposed to be doing all the time, to know that I'm the Lord, your God, who's always taking us out of exile, to have no other gods before me. Don't believe that anything else has power over us. Don't make anything into a God, not ourselves either. And then Shema Yisrael, to know there is one God and that everything we see and everything that we experience is coming from the one God to love God, to have fear and awe of God, and not to get sidetracked by things we see or feelings we feel, but to keep always living within godliness, being in connection with the one God. So if we have a moment before God gives us Mashiach, 
then what can we do to be connected and stay connected? So may we have Mashiach today that we don't need to fast. We do fast. May we have an easy fast. And may Mashiach come immediately and all the light of all the mitzvahs that we do, the Torah learning that we do, may all the light be revealed in the way that God wants. And the whole world will know that all there is is God. We will live with joyful revelation. Be blessed and have a wonderful week. Amen. Um.